okay, so um, uh, I first met John in the early 2000s when we uh, got uh, funding through the ARO to do uh, quantum computing with optics. Um, and then uh, after that grant finished, um, as Jeff mentioned, we had a grant uh, that uh, where we all got together in a big team. Um, and John was one of the members of the team along with uh, UQ, um, Vienna and uh, um, Imperial. Um, and, and at first it also uh, uh, didn't include uh, Jim Francis's group at uh, Maryland's, um, but he had put in a bid too and he had been doing uh, work on uh, quantum computing linear optics and uh, the the uh, the agencies decided that we should all play together so there was a bit of a personality issue between uh, Andrew White and Jim Franson um, so it became John's job to uh, get everyone to play together in a friendly manner and he he did that with a I was impressed very much with his uh, ability to uh, <laughs> uh, get everyone getting along um, so um, we we had this uh, uh, group. Um, this is one of the theory presentations that uh, that uh, John put together. The, obviously, you you can tell this uh, initial slide, securing the quantum battle space. Um, uh, so this was uh, a presentation of the theory group, which was his group, my group, and Terry Rudolph's group at Imperial. So um, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, his artistic uh, abilities come to the, the fore here. So it was always very nice. Uh, it was during this time that uh, I published my one paper with John, uh, which was uh, Peter Cox's uh, nice review of linear optics quantum computing. So I have only one paper with him, but it's one of my highest cited papers. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm not going to talk about optical quantum computing today, but as we heard, oh, sorry, actually, I was going to tell one story also that John told me during this time over lunch at one of these uh, defense meetings. Um, uh, John Rarity mentioned the fact that uh, John and uh, Roy Glauber were the only Americans at uh, this conference in the, in the late 80s. And uh, so this uh, was about them coming back together again. Um, so John was telling me that he'd got a call from, from Roy um, uh, because uh, asking for advice on how to uh, write a grant application. This was because uh, his university had, had been giving him money sort of uh, you know, on the basis of just saying he wanted some for many years, but uh, some new bureaucrat had come in and now wanted a, wanted an actual grant application, see exactly what it was that Roy was going to do with uh, his funding. And Roy hadn't written anything for so long that he didn't really know. So um, John was quite chuffed at the, the fact that he was being asked by Roy Glauber how to write a, a grant application. But he must have done a very good job because it was only a couple of years later that um, Roy won the, uh, the Nobel Prize and presumably his uh, funding problems disappeared at that point. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about foundational things today, um, and uh, we heard that uh, uh, John was very interested in that as well, and uh, I had many interesting discussions with him, um, and I, oops, oh, there, okay, um, I noticed that uh, even up until much uh, more recent times, he was doing work on this. Um, and uh, yeah, we've uh, uh, got some of the usual suspects here, uh, but here's John on a paper uh, about uh, delayed choice experiments. And, um, and it actually mentions Bohm in the, uh, in the introduction here, uh, which is uh, who is going to uh, feature uh, in uh, my talk. So what I'm going to talk about is measuring the trajectories of single photons. Um, this, I don't know 
why this doesn't, oops. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, work is based on a, a paper we published this year um, uh, with uh, Josh Fu, my PhD student, Estelle Asmodel, who is a previous PhD student, ah, thank you, um, and Austin, who's in the audience. Okay, so let's start with the question, can you measure the trajectories of quantum particles? So uh, the standard interpretation would say no for lots of reasons, like Heisenberg uncertainty, the fact that uh, particles travel as waves anyway, so what, what on earth does it mean to, to uh, uh, talk about their trajectories? And particle indistinguishability also seems to make this um, not a good concept. But of course, this is uh, an interpretation uh, and different interpretations uh, exist. So if we restrict ourselves to one universe, then there are in particular two interpretations where particles uh, are seen to have uh, real trajectories. One of them is the transactional interpretation. Um, here, it's uh, the particles can actually see into the future so if they see that they're heading towards a detector that's uh, at, uh, at an interference, destructive interference point, then they just won't go. Um, but if, if they look into the future and see other oh, the detectors up here, then they will go. So this is a very weird sort of a thing. Slightly less weird uh, interpretation is the one, is the Fermian interpretation. And here the particles are, uh, feel a force as they approach um, a region of destructive interference and they get pushed away from that uh, region. And so you have less probability of the particles turning up at those points. An interesting thing about the uh, Bohmian trajectories uh, that was shown by Howard Wiseman about 15 years ago is that they can be measured in a sense using a technique called weak measurements, uh, which uh, Howard talked briefly about, and I'll say a bit more about later. However, this technique was all about uh, slow moving particles, non-relativistic massive particles. Um, so what I wanna talk about here is what happens if we move to relativistic particles like photons. Okay, so uh, this is where I'm gonna go. So let me start with just a very quick uh, introduction to the what the Bohmian interpretation, how that works. So um, you see our, uh, the Schrodinger equation for a, a, a particle moving in a potential V up the top there. We can uh, split it up um, into the amplitude and the phase. And then it turns out that this S term behaves, uh, uh, obeys an equation that looks very much like a classical equation where, where S would be the action. Um, you've got the, the potential here, but you've also got this extra term Q, which is acting as if it's just another potential uh, pushing, the, pushing the, the particles around. Uh, this Q is, is a function of the amplitude. Um, and uh, so if you take this seriously, you can, you can come up with a, a velocity uh, field for the particles um, uh, related to S by uh, its gradient. So that's the basic idea. There's David Bohm. So if we wanted to measure trajectories, then somehow we have to measure uh, position and momentum at the same time. So we need to identify a velocity at a particular point, um, which seems impossible, but let's, let's see what we can do. So this involves uh, weak values. Uh, which again, Howard mentioned, um, I'll, I'll try and explain it in a little bit more detail so you can understand what's going on. So what we do is we prepare a system in some state. Now, if we did a strong coupling to this uh, uh, state um, and, and made a measurement, uh, then we'd basically be doing a Q and D measurement of the state and we would project the state into uh, one of the, the eigenstates of the measurement operator. However, if we only weakly couple, uh, then we can have a situation where we can to linear order get some information about the measurement operator, um, but 
not disturb the state at all. It's a linear order. So then what we can do is make a strong measurement um, and post select only on getting a particular result. Uh, and this defines and repeat this many times and get an average of uh, the, the measurement result. Um, and this is what's called the weak value. It was introduced by a runoff, Albert and Biedman in the late eighties. Um, and and this, this is what it ends up being uh, if you go through the calculations. So how does this help us? Well, what we could do is prepare, keep preparing our system in the same state, so a single particle in some particular state, uh, do a weak coupling and measure momentum, um, and then always post-select on a particular position. So preparing the state the same all the time, always looking, finding it in the same position, and then getting this weak measurement of momentum, but then we average it over and over again. And so we end up uh, with um, the average value of the momentum given that uh, the particle uh, was in this particular state and we found it in a particular position. Uh, so it looks like this. Um, so uh, this is the thing that Howard defined in his paper slightly differently, but uh, effectively the same. Um, and so uh, what Howard noted was that if you naively interpreted this re resulting weak velocity um, as the velocity field of particles following deterministic paths, as Bohm would say it, um, then you indeed what you find are the trajectories that Bohm predicted. So uh, this is this is a kind of amazing thing or interesting out, outcome, um, which uh, uh, caught the attention of the experimentalists. So this experiment was done by Ephraim Steinberg in uh, Toronto. Um, basically, it's a two slit experiment. We have uh, two sources of photons. Uh, there's a single photon that gets split up and can come out in two spots here. The spots, uh, as they propagate, uh, uh, diverge into each other and uh, you get an interference fringe at the end um, and then through a uh, clever use of polarization you can make weak value measurements of the momentum and find the trajectories um, and this is what they look like and the key thing is that you see that the, the photons <laughs> avoiding uh, the interference points and bunching up at the constructive interference points. Um, I'll be plotting everything as space time diagrams and in this, uh, so they're going to look more like this. Um, okay, so um, I told you in the paper Howard was talking about massive slow moving particles. So it seems a little puzzling at first that uh, this experiment worked given we were using photons, they were using photons. So um, before I get to the relativistic bit, uh, the first thing we needed to do was set up, set this up in a quantum optics type way. So actually modeling uh, uh, photons uh, rather than um, uh, massive particles. So we came up with a, a toy model that kind of had enough in it uh, to make it work, um, but not too much to make it too complicated. Uh, so it's just two dimensions, um, Z and X. We uh, only have uh, a uh, distribution, a Gaussian distribution in the X direction. Um, and depending on how we pick the energy, um, we can direct uh, our photon in a, in, in a particular direction. So if we pick KZ to be much larger than KX or K, I'm just calling it here, then we're propagating in the Z direction. Um, and we've basically got a continuous wave uh, uh, beam with a Gaussian transverse mode. On the other hand, we can pick KX, or just calling it K here to be, to be the dominant uh, 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 wave vector. And then it will propagate in the X direction. And now it's a plane wave 
Gaussian pulse. Or we can put it anywhere in between. Uh, we need a detector, um, and it's important that this detector just tells us uh, where the photon was found. It doesn't care which way the photon came from. So it's a unidirectional detector, um, and then that way we can uh, consider superposition modes. Um, so we set up uh, the detector just uh, uh, by constructing approximate um, position eigenstates and position operators. Um, so at this point, uh, I should mention that we're uh, working in the quantum optics approximation. So we're assuming that we're at a large frequency and that the, uh, the, um, the spread of the wave function uh, of the particles is it gets nowhere near zero. So this is a, a fantastically good approximation in optics, talk about all the time, um, but uh, it, it's an important point. Okay, so in the experiment, uh, the particles were coming out and we're just slowly um, uh, diverging into each other. So, um, so it was more like this, we're uh, very shallow angles and uh, the velocity in the x direction was very uh, um, slow. And uh, so we can make uh, the paraxial approximation uh, in this energy function and get something like this, um, and uh, then put it into the, uh, the equations and everything and generate the, uh, the trajectories. And you get things like this. If you're just looking at one beam, you see that uh, basically going at the speed of light, but sorry, not going at the speed of light, basically just uh, slowly um, moving out and, and spreading as it goes. Um, you can also look at superposition modes and then we get these, these interference fringes, which are much more interesting. We see the photons uh, dodging, dodging the, uh, the points of uh, destructive interference. Okay, it works, that's great. Um, so then you might just go, okay, well, let's just, let's just uh, make the photons go fast. So let's, let's have them collide head on, okay? And you put that in and it doesn't work, all right? Which is, uh, would be no surprise to Howard because he said in the paper it wouldn't work. <laughs> so, so why doesn't it work? And why, why did it work for the, for the first case? Well, the thing is that when you make this paraxial approximation, basically the maths ends up being the same as a slow moving uh, massive particle where we have a rest mass and we have a kinetic energy. And it's just a, a, the non-relativistic limit. And in that limit, uh, this continuity equation works. And this is the thing that preserves probabilities um, as the particles propagate. So. This, this, uh, this being satisfied means that the, that the density of uh, trajectories is directly related to the probability of finding the particle at a particular point. So that you get the same, uh, the same answers from the Bohmian version as you do from uh, quantum mechanics, standard quantum mechanics, as you would hope in a, an interpretation. However, when you send the photons directly at each other. Now you've effectively gone to a relativistic limit of very fast particles and, and this dispersion relation doesn't work anymore. Okay, so how do we fix it? So this is where we get onto uh, basically the new stuff. Um, so we need a different de definition of the velocity. Um, so basically before we were just using basically momentum on mass, um, but that's not, uh, that's not the relativistic, uh, the right relativistic um, uh, expression. What you want is the relativistic momentum over the relativistic energy, which then gives you the velocity. So that suggests that what you sh should be defining your weak value velocity as is the weak value of the momentum over the weak value of the energy or for optics, the weak value of the K vector over the weak value of the Hamiltonian. So 
we did that. So when you start calculating things, you get something that looks like a total mess here in terms of the wave function. Uh, but actually it turns out that these things are, once you divide them, are proportional to the uh, Klein-Gordon current divided by the Klein-Gordon density. Um, so this, this was suggested before as a relativistic generalization of, of uh, Bohmian mechanics, but for various reasons, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't deemed satisfactory. And we'll see how this, well, as we go along, we'll see what these problems are and why maybe it's not so bad in this situation. But the great thing about this is that uh, these are, these are component, the, the time component and the spatial components of a four vector. So it means, first of all, uh, it means the continuity is automatically obeyed. And secondly, it means that uh, these, these things transform in the correct way uh, under Lorentz transformation. So these are the sorts of trajectories you get. Um, they look basically the same, except now everything's traveling at the speed of light or the incoming beams is traveling at the speed of light. Um, so this is like in a, a sunyak where, where uh, the, the beams are uh, hitting head on and you're looking in the region of where there's a standing wave as they, as they interfere. Um, if you Lorenz boost, uh, then as I say, said, because uh, these, these things all transform in the right way, then you just get uh, the same definition of the, uh, of the trajectories uh, in terms of the weak values um, uh, as you would expect if these were really particles, uh, you know, little classical particles uh, that you are viewing from a different uh, reference frame. Um, okay, so that's nice. Um, all right, but now, but now let's talk about the problems. Okay, so uh, you might notice, so continuity and everything is, a, is observed, but you might be wondering about how can these be photons? So first of all, we see that we have these photons that stop and then turn around and go back the other direction. You certainly don't expect photons to do that. Um, I mean, what, you know, how can you act on a photon and make it do that? What sort of force would make it do that? Perhaps even worse, you may notice here that uh, in these regions, the velocity is actually going superluminal. So this, this is the speed of light and here we're, we're going at a steeper angle. Um, so, uh, how can we understand that? Um, so we have to now go beyond special relativity and consider what it is we are measuring from a more general point of view. So if we, uh, just have a general four vector in a, in a general relativistic sense, uh, then this relationship that um, uh, the, the spatial components over the energy give you the velocity is still true in the sense that it's a coordinate velocity. So dx dt, which is not necessarily the velocity of the particle uh, locally with the particle, but it's the velocity of the particle you calculate using your reference frame, your global reference frame. Now in a global reference frame in general relativistic metrics, uh, the speed of light is not always the speed of light. Um, you know, the sort of classic example is uh, looking down onto a black hole as the light approaches the black hole, it actually slows down and stops. Okay, so there we have photons that actually stop. Um, perhaps a little less familiar is that if you were deep down in a gravitational well and you look up at light traveling far above you and, and calculate its velocity, you'll actually find that it's superluminal. Yep. Yeah, but this is true for the uh, coordinate velocity. 
That's all I'm saying. And I'm saying what this weak value construction is measuring is that coordinate velocity. So I'm just saying it's not restricted to always being C. And it can stop and it can even be superluminal. Um, but you're right, uh, you need a pretty weird metric to get uh, your particle to uh, do things like this. Um, but such metrics uh, exist. Uh, we really don't know if you can make them uh, in our universe. Um, but an example is the Alcabiri metric, where this VS parameter here is to be interpreted as the flow of space time. And the flow of space time is not restricted by uh, the speed of light. Um, and in this metric, uh, you can basically uh, adjust your speed of light uh, just by adjusting this VS parameter um, to be faster or slower or stop. Um, so using this metric, uh, oh, here it is. Oh, back, 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 back. Um, and just assigning VS, uh, going slow, assigning VS uh, to have uh, particular values, then you can, you can create a metric um, in which the velocity field is exactly the one we see um, from the weak value measurements. And that velocity field will transform uh, in exactly the way you would ex you see from these measurements uh, in terms of uh, the, the velocities that you would see from different reference frames and things like that. Um, so I, uh, uh, some people may have noticed that there must be, something must break uh, if you boost into too high a reference frame. Um, indeed, this relationship uh, can the sign of this bottom thing here can flip, can diverge and flip. Um, so what on earth does that mean? Well, uh, if you plot the trajectories in a highly boosted frame, then you find that photons can asymptote to an infinite velocity and then start propagating backwards in time um, and then turn around and and go out again, which all sounds crazy, but no, what what happens in these regions is you get negative uh, regions of probability, um, and and the math still all works out. Continuity is still obeyed. So it looks crazy, but it's still it's it still kind of hangs together. Now, if uh, I mentioned the quantum optics uh, approximation, this. In this situation, the quantum optics approximation is still valid uh, because you don't, when you boost, you don't change the fact that you haven't got negative uh, frequencies. Um, but if you relax the quantum optics approximation, allow, allow uh, um, wave functions that overlap uh, with negative frequencies, uh, then, then you start getting uh, uh, negative Klein-Gordon probabilities that you can't really uh, do much about. So we don't really know uh, what happens there and that's something to look at in the future. Uh, I've got five minutes till, uh, till quest. Okay, so uh, that gives me enough time oh, to uh, talk about, um, so, so that was what was in the paper. Um, uh, but we're working on, well, what happens when we go to more than one photon? So now we could think of a, an experiment where we have two single photon sources and we send uh, uh, the two photons together and look in this interference region and see, see what, what happens to the tra trajectories there. Um, so we just, just basically took our single photon apparatus and said, okay, let's, let's just measure the weak values the same way we were doing them and see what happens. There's two photons now. So you want to have your experiments operating on the same time slice. And then in order to get your trajectories, you have to 
like move your, your detectors, your coincident detectors together in order to plot out the evolution of the trajectory. And you get things like this, um, where we're just looking. So because there's two trajectories, it gets a little bit harder to plot things. But here we're considering uh, a single initial condition for one of the photons um, and seeing what happens as we change the initial condition of the other photon. And you see, you get all these different trajectories. And in particular, when you get into the interference region, uh, what one photon is doing affects what the other photon is doing. So um, in this case, we're just looking uh, in another, another example, just looking at pairs of them where we bring them in like this. Um, more generally, you can do cats in time. Um, so these are uh, uh, a whole bunch of trajectories. Now, now we have uh, one detector on this axis, the position of one detector on this axis and the position of the other detector on this axis. So these two spots are not the two photons. It's the fact that the photons are indistinguishable. So basically, uh, you don't know whether X, X1 at a particular point, next two at a particular point, getting a click uh, is photon one and two or photon two and one. So you get these two things. But nevertheless, this allows you to, to put the, uh, the densities in. And you can see that, that they indeed obey uh, the uh, standard probability densities as they propagate through each other. And you get these interference effects, which are now two photon interference effects, effects like Hom type uh, interference. Okay, so the weird thing here is now that these are correlated trajectories. Um, and uh, you, you probably know this is a, a thing about, uh, even in the non-relativistic case, uh, that Bohmian mechanics is a non-local hidden variable theory, uh, has to be in order to, to get things like Bell inequalities right. So here we, we uh, are seeing non-local correlations. So a question that we are still sort of uh, banging our head up against is what would a metric that, that pushes the photons around in this sort of way look like? Um, is that even possible? Um, okay, it's going to change. Okay, so that basically brings me to my conclusion. So um, introduce an operational definition of Bohmian trajectories, which works uh, for uh, photons in quantum optics. It's intriguing, but at least for single photons, you can introduce uh, this general relativistic type metric which, um, which would direct the photons around in, in just the way uh, that you find. Um, we're investigating what happens with multiple particles. It seems to work, but the interpretation of what, what is guiding the particles becomes more difficult. Um, and as I mentioned going through, another um, interesting thing to consider is what happens with um, uh, when you go beyond the quantum optics approximation. And we, which is what would happen if you act really quickly on, on the photons um, or things like that. So just back to um, my coworkers and I'll say thank you and take any questions. Thanks, Tim. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Yep. Same as say for like a sigma sub five mm -hmm. or sigma I don't know hundred. Um, and I was wondering if there is like a connection or like at least those kinds of subscriptional values with your you know going like faster than light values. Yeah. So when when you go into that boosted regime, um, then the reason the probabilities are going negative is because the energy is going negative. So you're getting anomalous uh, weak values uh, for the energy. Uh, that are lying outside the, the eigenvalue range. But even if it's because that's also the case for when the photons are going faster than light, right? 
No, no, it's not. Uh, when there's when they're when they're superluminal, no, they, things are just normal. There's no. It's, it's, <laughs> I, in terms of the the probability densities and things like that, yeah, yeah. The, the Klein Gordon probability density, they're well behaved. So if so, in the if in the static situation with the quantum optics approximation, so by static I mean the fringes are not moving um, in space or moving in time, then uh, the Klein-Gordon probability density and therefore the weak value energy is always positive. So it's only when you do these boosts or you go to you know situations where you start to expect particle production or something like that, that you get these negative um, things. Maybe? Yes, uh, one thing that's very intriguing here about the you know, connection of the, uh, the uh, negative probability and going backwards in time. Mm -hmm. So in the other space you see, you know, the, the, you know, say, say the other space you see negative probability uh, in quantum mechanics is when we think about quasi functions and we have bigger functions with negative probability. Mm -hmm. Do you think there might be, is there a way I might think about what we, so, that, that, so, you know, we could sort of throw up our hands and say, you know, this is clearly just you know, a thing. Very negative <laughs> but is there a, a sufficient connection to some trajectory like picture? So that that's a, a very interesting point. Um, I'm I'm not so sure. The negative probability is very much about a, a kind of a, uh, yeah. So these uh, are in these are in space rather than in quadrature in space, variables, in, space, space. in rather than phase space. Yeah, but in some sense their resolution is similar. Yeah. So you know, like you get you don't see. Um, uh, you don't see negative probabilities of the marginals in the Wigner function because when you when you integrate across the negative areas uh, cancel out with the positive, and it's similar here. If you are measuring over a, a time where the quantum optics approximation is still resolved, make, making a strong measurement, then you will average over that negative region, and and you won't see a negative uh, probability there. So it's this. Some sort of connection there, but I'm I'm not sure that it whether it's uh, just analogous or there's something more going on. Okay, we are just out of time, but I want to ask one question, and yeah. I get to because I'm, <laughs> um, this is a general one for those of you who think about you know Bohmian mechanics, or at least you two. Um, for someone who is maybe in the shut up and calculate yep. interpretation of quantum mechanics, is there a reason to learn it? Or are there maybe calculational advantages to problems which I could solve using methods I already know? Um, I, I guess, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that there's some ob objective way of measuring these things. I think that's one of the things that comes out of it, from, so from a, an ex experimental or empirical point of view, it's kind of interesting. I mean, our... Our hope would be that um, maybe at some point you see a different way of calculating things, like via, you know, some sort of geometric interpretation or something that that um, you know points to some way forward, um, you know, in gravitational problems or something like that. So, so I guess that's that's one reason for for looking at these types of things. 